Welcome to The Kill Count, where we tally up the victims in all our favorite horror movies. I'm Chelsea Rebecca, and today we're looking at Bones and All, released in 2022. Bones and All follows a pair of young lovers who share an unnatural craving for human flesh. It's part cannibal horror and part road trip movie. In fact, you'd better know your state postal codes. Mostly though, Bones and All is a young adult romance film. It reminds me of Near Dark mixed with Terrence Malick's Badlands, a combination that probably wouldn't work without director Luca Guadagnino. Guadagnino gained international recognition with his 2017 film Call Me By Your Name, which prepped him for this movie by giving him experience with both Timothy Chalamet and cannibalism. Here he combines that movie's coming-of-age romanticism with the horror of his 2018 Suspiria remake. The Italian filmmaker also dives deep into Americana, making the most of his first feature shot in the United States. I'll admit that I didn't love this movie when I first saw it, but that may have been because it was at an influencer screening full of people who talked the entire time. A rewatch revealed its brilliance to me. I still think it's a little too long and maybe a bit too languid, but it's filled with immaculate cinematography and outstanding acting. I feel like I always forget how much I like Chalamet until I see him again. He's great. Bones and All also has amazing production design, effortlessly situating the movie in the late 1980s. This isn't the usual urban depiction of the 80s, laden with pop culture touchstones. This is a realistic, rural, unplugged depiction a time when the entire country dressed like the town from Napoleon Dynamite. The setting is a perfect match for the movie's themes of queer identity. Yes, its main couple is heterosexual, but their struggle to hide their true selves is an apt metaphor for queerness, especially with gay men having written and directed it. It's really beautiful and moody, one of those kinds of movies you can just let wash over you. How many people will eat their makers when- <laughs> Sorry, one moment, I- Sense another one. You're like me, aren't you? You use today's sponsor, Raycon. How'd you know? You can always sense a fellow Rayconner, if you know how. Oh, I thought I was the only one. Don't be ridiculous. With a price that's half that of similar quality competitors, over 50,000 five-star reviews, and a free return guarantee if you have any problems, Raycon is trusted by listeners the world over. Wow, I never knew. I'd just been drawn to their crystal clear call quality and three customizable sound profiles. Of course you were. After all, you shouldn't have to eat an arm and a leg for high quality sound and essential smart tech listening features. Yeah, you're, wait, did you say eat? What? No. Anyway, with their custom gel tips making for the perfect in-ear fit, you can use them all throughout the day. I use mine while I'm working out, or playing video games, or eating. Right. Yeah. Me too. Well, thanks for all the info. Fun to learn about this uh, community. I'm gonna go find some other Rayconners. Damn. Lost another one. Want to become a Rayconner too? Click the link in the description box or go to buyraycon.com slash deadmeat to get 15% off your Raycon purchase. <sighs> Sorry about that. How many people will eat their makers when they are crossed by these star-crossed cannibals? Let's find out and get to the kills. The movie begins with some art that's really struggling with perspective and, uh, lines. These paintings suck. Oh, probably because they're done by high schoolers in Virginia. Marin here is the new kid in school, which has got to be rough when you've got the worst set of bangs since Gale Weathers circa 2000. Don't get too cocky, Michelle Duggar, you're not innocent either. Director Luca Guadagnino says Marin's fringe hairstyle was directly inspired by a minor character in Silence of the Lambs. A friendly girl named Sherry invites Marin to a sleepover that night. Before her dad Frank falls asleep to Rudy Giuliani ASMR in their amber-hued home, he locks Marin in her bedroom, his only safety measure against her nature. She sneaks out in boots and long johns, looking like an old prospector, and follows the power lines to her friend's house. You can just feel the nervousness as she knocks at the door. She knows she's not normal like Sherry and her friends, including Kim, who's smelling kinda nice. This is the most horror movie looking sleepover I've seen in a minute. Kim and Marin try to fill us in on some backstory and... What? Cinnamon Blaze. Awesome, Sherry. 
That's great. After Kim comments on this scene's lighting, It's too orange. Baron lets her know that her orange finger's just fine. In fact, it's downright delicious. She chomps that thing like a carrot stick. An interesting twist on the get your friend to piss themselves sleepover prank. Marin is sent home to her dad, who really needs to talk to Lee Pace about keeping a go bag. Papa Frank isn't a snitch and relocates the two of them to Maryland, but he doesn't stay with her long. On her 18th birthday, he decides to abandon her by moonlight leaving behind her birth certificate and an audio tape he recorded. On it, Frank explains that Marin's been having people-eating episodes since she was a baby. The first was when she killed and partially consumed her babysitter at the age of three. No kill graphics for these victims, though, since we're only told about them via voiceover. Frank has been covering for Marin her entire life, hoping that she would get better. But she hasn't, and now that she's an adult, he's washing his hands of this responsibility. Easy when you still have all ten fingers. I gotta leave you to figure it out for you yourself. Like your mother did. Her birth certificate reveals details about her mother Janelle, who left right after Marin was born. Since Frank refused to tell her anything about her, she decides to head for Janelle's birth state of Minnesota. Unfortunately, she only has enough cash to get as far as Ohio. While waiting at the bus station, she's approached by the man, the myth, the instant legend, Sully. Laden with TGI Friday style flair and immediately off putting, Marin's distrust of him is really emphasized by the obfuscated framing. Sully, full name Sullivan describes himself as a fellow eater, a particularly powerful eater who's tracked her down by following his nose. You can smell lots of things if you know how. Marin has finally met another person who's just like her, an experience many queer people can relate to, especially if you were raised suppressing that aspect of yourself. Also, I don't think this is something you could see in the trailer, so this right here was genuinely the most shocking plot twist of 2022 for me. Sully has a nasty little ponytail! He tells her she can totally trust him, cause his number one rule is that eaters don't eat eaters. He says this amidst CGI rain that I wish James hadn't pointed out, because now I I can never unsee it, and neither can you. He invites Marin into a home with very bad wallpaper promising to make her some dinner. She keeps her guard up while he tries to charm her by complimenting her intelligence. <laughs> Smart. Sully is played by Oscar-winning British actor Mark Rylance, who I most associate as the man for all reasons to get a divorce Thomas Cromwell in Wolf Hall. Rylance drew on his experiences growing up in Wisconsin. I was raised for 10 years in the Midwest, so I was excited about about making a film in the Midwest. His eccentric performance was guided by Guadagnino's untraditional directing style, which relied on sensory experiences, like teaching Rylance how to prep a Cornish hen. As delicious as this wet, raw chicken looks, there's an even more special treat for the main course. It's something Marin smells upstairs. She sniffs out an elderly entree who's fallen and can't get up. Sully tells her they need to eat, but Marin's snot into the idea of letting this woman die. Oh no, Marin, you wanna get that? Okay, oh ew, don't wipe your face right after. That's what happens when you watch too much Giuliani. It takes until morning for the old lady to die, and by then Marin's hunger has overwhelmed her doubts. She finds Sully on his knees, hog wild and pigging out. We see more of Mark Rylands here than I think anyone could ever expect to see, except in Bridge of Spies, full hole. She decides to join in, and their feasting is intercut with poignant reminders of the life their lunch once led. The prosthetic effects in Bones and All were done by Jason Hamer's company Hamer FX, who also turned Harry Styles into a merman in his Music for a Sushi Restaurant video. Instead of solid silicone pieces, they used layers of different materials to replicate muscles, tendons, and bones. For instance, the finger that Marin bit off was silicone with a urethane bone inside, topped off with a blood tube running under the actress's hand. For Mrs. Harmon's full body corpse, they used techniques from the dental industry and created edible silicone chunks that the actors could actually bite into. According to special effects artist Mike Smithson, the fake blood was made of maraschino cherries, dark chocolate, and fruit roll-ups. After they eat, it's time for Vanity Fair's What's in My Bag featuring Sully. He proudly presents a rope he's been making from the hair of his victims. Sully keeps it as a reminder of everyone he's eaten, but between this and the fact that he's still hanging out in his underwear, Marin should probably reject his offer to be cannibal buds. You can bum with me as long as you like. I think she's bummed with you enough, dude. Marin wisely decides to catch the next bus out of town. Sully will remember that. Oh! While shoplifting at a convenience store, Marin sees some Hawaiian shirted harassment. You don't have lunch with me? 
It's a fair question, but when she speaks up, the guy turns his attention to her. Luckily, the chivalry is here. Hey! You're in control, buddy. The fiery redhead provokes the guy to meet him for a fight outside. When Marin leaves later, she's drawn towards a nearby building, cause she can smell there's something tasty inside. Maybe that's where all the Lunchables went. Oh wait, it's Timothy Chalamet, whose bloody bod reveals that he's killed and eaten the blue-shirted bully off screen. He introduces himself as Lee, and Marin gets right to the important stuff. I'm 18 if you're wondering. This scene is just a flex by Guadagnino and Arsini Kachaturin, his director of photography who is only 27 years old? The whole thing is shot during magic hour, that's insane. They used ultra speed and super speed Panavision lenses to capture as much light as possible, and constantly changed their key light to match the setting sun. Shooting on 35mm film is way more difficult than digital, but this movie's beautiful cinematography shows why it's worth it. Lee can tell Marin's a fellow muncher of man and offers to let her tag along with him. She accepts since she's been a bit lost in space on her own. Doesn't hurt that Lee's a beautiful boy. He's played by Timothy Chalamet, who was eager to work again with Guadagnino after he helped launch his career. We had great experience doing Call Me By Your Name. I was experiencing the beautiful blooming of his path in cinema. Chalamet also served as co-producer on the film. Meanwhile, Marin is played by Taylor Russell, last seen on the kill count in Escape Room. She's great in those movies, and I hope her amazing performance here gets her even more attention. Lee takes Marin to his victim's house by following the address on his license. Wow. Oh, this place is fucking sad. Decorated with a kiss poster and some porn. It's not even a man cave, it's a man compost pile. Marin, don't sit on that- No! Lee dances around to lick it up, a song that might as well be about the blood still splattered on his neck. The two start to grow closer, with Marin feeling safe enough to shed her dad's jacket, which she's been wearing as a protective layer. Costume designer Juliana Persanti had worked with Guadagnino on Call Me By Your Name and Suspiria. She dressed Lee in clothes that he would have taken from the people he's eaten. His wardrobe is sort of genderless and is a little bit all over the place and what he's wearing today could be gone tomorrow. The hat he wears now originally belonged to the Hawaiian shirt bully in the store. The shirt in his first scene may have been repurposed from an old lady's dress. The flower print there and on his other shirts matches Marin's floral dress. It symbolizes the unity between them. Persanti said the two of them together should look like one big bouquet. It's here they really start looking out for each other, an aspect of their relationship that echoes the experiences of many young queer people who may find themselves without parents or a traditional home life. KY. Jelly. Their next stop is in Lee's hometown in Kentucky. He shows Marin the slaughterhouse he used to work at, an apt first job for a fine young cannibal. It drives Marin crazy. Hey girl, what if we kissed in the slaughterhouse? Tasty. He also shows her the house he grew up in, underlining this movie's mastery of sad home decor. I can't quite explain, but this entire movie smells like mildew to me. At his encouragement, she snoops around and checks out his memories. You're wrong. They continue the road trip towards Minnesota, with Lee letting Marin drive his truck. Ma, 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 ma. In Missouri, they make a pit stop to peep on skinny dippers and trade stories about their Donner de Flowerings. What was your first time like? It was a babysitter. Mine too. They're soon joined by two besties, Jake and Brad, who have smelled them out. Jake is played by Michael Stahlberg, who played the very different Mr. Perlman in Call Me By Your Name, while Brad's played by David Gordon Green, who's probably better known for his work behind the camera, including directing the recent Halloween trilogy and the upcoming Exorcist film. Jake's an avid eater and tells campfire tales about a titular delicacy called full bones. Full bones? When you eat the whole thing, bones and all. Yet somehow, this dude in overalls with no shirt on is the less fucked up of the two. Cause Brad, the budding cannibal, is a cop. Oh, and also not an eater. Absolutely normal! He is. <laughs> kind of a groupie, I guess. Yeah, he's a regular Joe. That'll leave a sour taste in your mouth. I don't care if this guy is rocking a Dokken shirt, you don't want to be around that kind of crazy. So Marin and Lee ditch the disgusting brothers. Oh, yeah. 
<laughs> now they're in Iowa, the worst part of any road trip. You're so boring, Iowa. You really need a roller coaster or some- Oh, hey, look at that. At what's probably some kind of corn carnival? The teens get touchy at the top of a Ferris wheel. Lee's not here to win himself a toy, though. He's on the lookout for some fair food and uses his Chalamet charm to snag a carny in a scene that was shot like it was directed by Kenneth Anger. I feel so bad for this guy. He was probably just excited to meet a hot gay guy and get corny in the horn field. Marin hears a handy happening, and it's not Isaac and Malachi exploring each other's bodies. She watches as Lee waters the crops with the poor Carney's blood. The natural born killers chow down on these stringy flesh and muscle. Oh, it's so gross and disgusting. Is eating the nipples first kind of like eating the ears first on a chocolate money? They steal the guy's car and do the same thing they did with Lick It Up, but when they get to his house, they see that the lights are on and somebody's home. My God! That man had a family! Their not-so-victimless crime sends Marin into a crisis. She doesn't want to make waves this way and can't cope with all the innocent lives they're ruining. Menace. Soda! Unable to find her mom, Marin tracks down her groovy-looking grandma, Barbara Kearns. Barbara lets Marin browse some family photos and explains that she adopted her mother, Janelle, after she was found abandoned as a baby. They stopped talking after Janelle ran away with Marin's father. When she wanted to get married, we didn't agree. Hmm, wonder why that was. Barbara is played by Jessica Harper, last seen on the kill count in the original Suspiria. She also appeared in the 2018 remake, which was directed by Guadagnino and written by Bones and All screenwriter David Kajanich. Kajanich's script for Bones and All was based on the 2015 novel of the same name by Camille DeAngelis. Barbara reveals that Marin's mother admitted herself to a nearby mental hospital. Oh man, when you're in a place where the nurse is dressed like that, you know it's not a good time. Marin finds her mom a complete traumatized mess. A cannibal who's eaten her own hands, presumably between slices of bread like a cartoon. Janelle is played by Chloe Savini, last seen on the kill count in, oh hey, one of my episodes, American Psycho. But Anino offered her the role after working with her on We Are Who We Are, a miniseries he co-created and directed. While Janelle is non-verbal, she wrote Marin a letter in case she ever found her to explain why she left. I promised I would never hurt either of you, but how could we be sure? She says that people like them are monsters and aren't able to love. Janelle tries to rescue her daughter from a life of hardship with a mouth-to-mouth -mouth mercy kill. Marin ends the visit and runs outside, where she yells at Lee since they killed and ate an innocent man. He defends it as necessary to survive. Marin decides that it's gonna be a solo trip from now on. She sneaks away while Lee takes a shat nap, and he's unable to find her when he looks for her later in more magic hour shots. Show-offs. Now by her lonesome, Marin runs in to Sully, who's been following her since their meeting in Ohio. She's still skeeved out by Sully's just everything, so when Sully again offers companionship, she turns him down. He does not take it graciously. Fuck you. Uh oh, Sully's an incel. Fuck you. Missy. Oh, what is she a fugly bitch to? You dumb. C oh. That's a uh, Okay. The state of July. Marin starts missing Lee after a while and tries to find him through Kayla, his younger sister. We met her earlier when Lee stopped by his family home. Kayla is played by Anna Cobb, who delivered a Prime Rib nominated lead performance as Casey in We're All Going to the World's Fair. She discloses that the reason Lee is always on the road is because he's suspected of killing their abusive father who went missing four years ago. Kayla believes he's innocent, but Lee's tire iron night terror suggests he has that killer instinct. This right here is Brad, David Gordon Green's character, and I'm going to assume this kill happened for real and count it. Bones and All could have been a much longer movie, as they reportedly shot a lot more footage and scenes. My guess is the cut scenes were used as flashes in the various dreams Marin and Lee have. I wonder if Lee took Marin's words to heart about not killing innocent people. We see him looking hungry while a mother and her kids walk by. Maybe he decided against feasting on them and sought out someone who he knew deserved to die, the creepy foe eater Brad. Kayla reveals Lee is camped out at a nearby lake, sending Marin running down that hill to reunite with him. The teen lovers then head to the rolling fields of Nick. Lee opens up to Marin about what happened to his father. He attacked Lee and tried to take a bite out of him, revealing himself as an eater. Lee knocked him out and hit him in an old barn, and eventually pulled a reverse Saturn. I ate him right the fuck up. And it felt fucking great. 
nothing like a tale of patricide to get the juices flowing. Marin tells Lee she loves him, and they get to smooching against this beautiful backdrop. While most of the movie was shot in Ohio around Cincinnati and Columbus, and northern Kentucky around Maysville, this scene, and the final shot of the film, was shot in Oglala National Grassland in Nebraska's Sioux County. A month later, the two have settled down and decided to be people. And where are they? Yeah, we're in Ann Arbor now. Oh shit, go blue! Marin got a job at the university at the bookstore. Oh, you know she works at Shaman Drum, R.I.P. It's a charmed life for a pair of recovering cannibals. Unfortunately, their happy ending is sullied by an unwelcome guest. The van man takes Marin hostage, getting way too wet and sloppy for comfort. He thinks Marin knows too much about him, but before he can kill her, Lee comes back home and gives him the Black Christmas special. Lee takes a stab to the chest, but Marin manages to wrestle Sully's knife away and return the favor sevenfold. They drag him into the bathroom, where Marin starts turning him inside out. It's a painful, messy end, but at least the bathtub makes for easy cleanup. Marin takes a beat to catch her breath, but Lee's having a harder time, probably due to that punctured lung. As he sits there bleeding out, Marin finds a tragic possession in Sully's bag. The addition of Kayla's hair to the end of Sully's human hair kill tracker keeper. That's evidence enough for me to add her to the list. Lee realizes his sister's dead and that he's not far behind. It's a tearful moment as they realize there's no saving him. As he dies, Lee asks Marin to eat him, bones and all. She eventually relents and carries out the request in a scene set to You Made It Feel Like Home, an original song by the film's composers Trent Reznor and Atticus Ross of Nine Inch Nails. We later see their apartment tidied up and empty, with only Lee's necklace left behind. The movie ends with one last shot of their ravenous romance. How many courses were served on this cross-country cannibal road trip? Let's find out and get to the numbers. Great, hon. Uh, good to the numbers bit. Not to impose here, but I found that sometimes it helps if you like point when you say it. So, so try it more like, let's find out and get to the numbers. Ah! Statistic, yep. Statistic, yep, yep. I counted seven kills in Bones and All. The victims consisted of five men and two women, giving us this bony blue pie chart. Surprisingly, we've only seen this count and breakdown twice before on the kill count. With the runtime of 131 minutes, that left us with a kill on average every 18.71 minutes. I'll give the Golden Chainsaw for coolest kill to Sully. It's a drawn out and brutal death scene befitting of this movie's big bad. Dull Machete for lamest kill will go to Barry, the blue Hawaii boy who got eaten off screen. And that's it. Bones and All came out in 2022 and received positive reviews despite underperforming at the box office. Next week, Zorn finishes the Critters franchise with Critters Attack, and after that, we'll return you to your regularly scheduled host, James. Until then, I'm Chelsea Rebecca. This has been The Kill Count. Thanks for watching the Bones and All Kill Count. This is Molly. She says thank you, too. Also, one thing I didn't mention in the script that I want to point out is all the great wood paneling in this film. It looks great. I don't know where they found so much of it intact. It's beautiful. I'm really envious of it. I tried to make our podcast set look like that. Go listen to the Demi podcast. I'm going to plug my show while I have your attention. Thank you. Uh, we're going to be back soon. Are we back already? I don't know either, <laughs> but go listen to it. And uh, thank you, Beacon people. And also, it's never deli with Sully.